Thank you all, and thank you for being here. I know it's a Friday afternoon, and I'm sure everyone has weekend plans. So I'll try to keep this uh, worth it uh, for you guys. And um, it's, it's great to be back in London, which is a city I consider my home away from home. I've spent many a uh, family vacation over here, and more importantly, uh, the UK as a country means a lot to me because I did my undergraduate degree over here at a little, uh, quaint little city not far from London, Bath, which if you haven't visited, you should visit. It's a beautiful place. And uh, so if I give away my age, 20 years ago, I was 18, and I was trying to figure out um, what to do with my life. You know, it was time to go uh, on to that next step in terms of higher education. And so, of course, I turned to the most trusted resource any teenager uses when making a decision, which is my friends. And I said, what are you guys doing uh, when you're graduating? And they said, well, we're going abroad to study. Now, this is 20 years ago. So when I you know, decided to join them and I went to my parents and told them that I've decided to go abroad and study, initially there was a little bit of you know, hesitation because A, I'm the eldest uh, of four girls and none of the women in our family had gone abroad to study. Uh, but eventually they agreed and I applied um, to the University of Bath because without, again, without much research, but because A, I didn't think I was capable of getting into the top tier Oxford and Cambridge universities and B, because my dad thought it was a quiet little town and your cousin's not far away, that's a good enough reason to go there. Um, so that's the, the extent of research that went into my decision as to where to study. And then I decided that there was this thing called the internet that I enjoyed using, so I'll just study computer science. Again, very little research and very little guidance that I had at that age. And so I landed up at Bath and, you know, thinking that, so this is my ticket to an amazing career. I will spend the next three years here learning, um, you know, coming up with new ideas, ambitions, and then hopefully graduate and build a career. I spent the first week homesick, but after that, pretty much got into the routine of going into a classroom, watching the professor. In those days, it was projectors and slides, so he would literally write on the slides, and we would copy it word for word. And then I'd spend my holidays memorizing what I had written and regurgitating it for an exam. Uh, in, in the hope that the university uh, or the professor would give me a good grade so that I could earn this prestigious degree. And so three years later, got the grades I needed, uh, graduated, thought that, okay, I'm, I'm now ready to take on the real world. And I was in for a rude awakening. Uh, I, I landed up in the UAE, had no idea how to apply to jobs, didn't have the skills required for most of the jobs. And the reason I'm telling this story is because actually, you look at the situation today, 20 years later, and nothing has changed. We still have over a million youth graduating every year from uh, MENA, in, in universities in MENA, about 500,000 in the GCC alone. And they've played by the book. This is what they've been told. If you've watched Ken Robinson's uh, TED Talk, he said that you know, we have a very linear approach to education in the sense that you start, you go to school, you do your GCSEs, you do well in your, I don't know if you, they still do GCSEs, but in my days, um, GCSEs, then you do well in your A-levels, and then you go to university and you study one subject, you choose which subject at 18 that you are gonna commit to for life, and then you study that for three or four years, and then you graduate, and then you get a career. And so that's what most of them have been told. And they've been sold this dream that, you know, you're going to go to university, you're going to graduate, and you're going to get a great job. And you look at their faces, and it's genuinely the faces of hope personified. They come into university very excited, and then they leave, and then they, and they realize that actually the real world is nothing at all like what they have, had expected. And in fact, one out of every two graduates believes that they are not ready or not equipped for a job or uh, to find a job. So I just want to zoom in on one of these youth, which is um, Sally, who is a lovely lady that I met about a year ago, this time last year. And uh, I was interviewing her for a job. And so, you know, I looked at her uh, letter, which said that she was looking for an opportunity to be challenged. And then I looked at her resume and I saw a bachelor's in computer engineering. And I thought, uh, sorry, uh, chemical, um, chemical engineering. So I thought, um, well, chemical engineering, and you're applying for a role, a space coordinator role at an entrepreneurship entity. What's the link here? What's this got to do with what you did at your bachelor's? And so it turns out that Sally, this is her story. She is the youngest of five uh, children. 
at, in grade 12, she decided that she wanted to go to university and wanted to go to AUS because it's one of the better universities or potentially the best university in the UAE. She was told by her advisor that, well, in order you, for you to go to AUS, you need a scholarship because your parents can't afford it. And honestly, looking at your profile, you don't have what it takes to earn that scholarship. And of course, the biggest motivator for any youth is to tell them they can't do it. And so she went out there, she got some extracurricular activities, did really well in her A-levels, did well in chemistry, and got that scholarship to AUS. And since most of the women in her family studied chemical engineering, she went ahead and studied the same thing. The thing is, two years into her degree, she realized this isn't what I want to do. And, you know, so she basically couldn't change because she had the scholarship. She was stuck in this system, had to graduate with chemical engineering, and basically used her um, electives to study her real passion, which is music. And that's the situation with most of the students today. She graduated, eventually started looking for a job, didn't have the skills, again, that were required by employers. They kept telling her, we need to see more experience, but she wasn't able to get the opportunities to gain that uh, further work experience, and so she was stuck in that vicious catch-22. And like I said, this is a common, um, common challenge and an expensive challenge. On average, at least in some of the universities, um, including in the UAE, students are spending over 100, students and families are spending over $100,000 on tuition alone. Tuition alone. Um, in the, I mean, this is a global problem. Obviously, it's not specific to MENA. In the US, you know, the average student debt now is, uh, I think, about $37,000. It's literally second only to home mortgages. It's higher than your typical uh, car, um, vehicle debt, and the uh, credit card debt, and so on. So um, again, this is a common problem around the world, and it's, it's, it's an expensive challenge. And the tragedy, or the tragic part of it, is that 40% of university graduates in MENA are unemployed. So not only are they spending a lot of money, but they're unable to actually recoup that investment uh, through their jobs. I don't need to spend a lot of time talking about how big the unemployment challenge is. I mean, I'll give you a few figures. 11% um, unemployment in the MENA region overall, the highest in the world. 30% in the youth population alone, youth defined as 15 uh, to 24. That represents a $40 billion economic opportunity that's lost for the region. Um, we have one million uh, youth coming into the labor market every year, and just to give you a sense, over 30% of our population is under the age of 30. So I think it paints pretty much the picture or gives you a background as to um, the talk that I want to give today or as to what the possible solutions are to this situation. So the challenge really is twofold. The challenge is that A, students don't have the skills required by employers. And the funny thing is you would assume that, you know, given unemployment is an issue, most employers would find, have it pretty easy finding the talent that they're looking for. But 40% of employers say that they can't actually find the talent that they're looking for because the skills aren't out there. And so we have this uh, battle happening between education institutions who are saying, well, we are places that you know, create and disseminate knowledge. We do research and we do teaching. It's not our job to um, give them the skills required to succeed in the workplace. And then you have the employers complaining that, you know, the, the education, um, so universities are saying that uh, the employers are not doing their job in terms of uh, investing in uh, training and, uh, you know, developing the graduates. And the, the employers are pointing the fingers at the education, um, education entities saying that they're not providing the students with the skills. And in the middle of this is a student that's stuck between this um, battle that's happening between the two uh, players. And then on top of that, even if they did have the skills, there are simply not enough jobs. According to the ILO, um, we need to create 5 million jobs in the MENA region every year until 2030, just to keep pace with this growing uh, working age population. So there comes a point in everyone's life and I'm sure many of you have gone through this, where uh, there's, a, there's an organization called Echo and Green. They call this moment um, the, a moment of obligation. And that moment was basically, that happened to me in 2013. It's a moment where you genuinely feel compelled to work on a particular challenge, and it deeply informs who you are as a person and what your purpose here is in life. At, in 2013, 
I was working at the Khalifa Fund for Enterprise Development in Abu Dhabi, and you know, I realized as I was spending more and more time with Emirati youth, that a lot of them didn't have the career guidance and mentorship that many, other, many others of us are lucky to have. And so I quit my job and started a social enterprise called Khairat to help specifically Emirati graduates enter the private sector. I had spent a lot of time in private companies like Shell and PwC and McKinsey, and I was always one of just a handful of Emiratis, sometimes the only Emirati in the company. And so I really wanted to see what I could do to change that situation. And then about a year later, I was approached by Sheikh Abdur bin Sultan al-Qasimi to start another venture in the same space, but this time, rather than employment, focused on entrepreneurship. Because like I said, job creation is another priority for the region. And so, unlike a lot of us who may look at the youth as a burden for the region, Sheikh Abdur has always said that the youth are an asset and an opportunity for us, and we really need to invest in them. And hence, uh, this platform called Shira, by the way, Shira, for those who don't speak Arabic, means sale. And we often like to think of, of ourselves as the sail on these students, uh, or we call them captains, on their ships, um, basically. And so Shirar was started in January 2016 in Sharjah. How many people here know Sharjah or have been to Sharjah? OK, quite a few of you. So if you, uh, for those of you who don't know Sharjah, we often use a, a good uh, comparison. We say in, in the US, if uh, New York is Dubai, DC would be Abu Dhabi and Boston would be Sharjah because Sharjah has truly um, built itself up as a hub for culture, art, and education. And when you look at Sharjah's education hub, there are, they have a, a university city currently in Sharjah uh, housing over six or seven different educational institutions with 20,000 current students studying. They're all co-located next to each other. So the universities are literally right, right next to each other. In addition, there are 25,000 alums that have graduated from these universities over the last almost 20 years. This was established in 97. It's a very diverse group of students in terms of nationalities. It's over 100 nationalities. And in terms of the degree programs offered, it's everything from business and law through to um, business, um, uh, um, sorry, medicine and design as well. And then on top of that, we're also in the process of building a research and technology park that will attract companies to come and actually do their research and product development in Sharjah, which I think is something that's very much needed in the region. And so the idea was to build, you know, most of these students are graduating, they're looking for jobs, they're not finding jobs, they're spending a lot of time unemployed or underemployed. So the idea behind Sharjah is to create a platform for them to create their own jobs. This is the University of Sharjah. This is where Shira is based. So we have a nice 650 square meter space. In fact, I have a picture here. This is our mothership, as we like to call it. Um, it was actually designed by a graduate of the American University of Sharjah. So everything we do in entrepreneurship, we always say we're walking the talk. Um, we use students or graduates and their startups to do all our work for us. So the design was done by an design, um, interior designer who graduated from AUS. Our logo was done by a designer who graduated from AUS. And there's a small cafe, which you can't see in this picture, which is owned by a graduate of AUS. So like I said, walking the talk. But more important than the space itself, and you're most welcome to visit anytime you're in Sharjah, we're based at the American University of Sharjah and we'd love to give you a tour, but more important than the space itself is the journey that students go through when they're in Sharjah. And this is how our journey works. So we start with ideation, uh, where students come up with particular ideas or particular challenges that they want to solve. You have a quick two to three week course uh, where they kind of refine their business model. There's then an incubator which runs for up to 12 months where they spend their time building their team and their products and so on. And then there's an accelerator program, which is a short, intense, four month program focused on taking their products to market. So in order to get into the accelerator, you actually need to have an advanced prototype. 
In terms of the benefits that you get from being in the accelerator program, we actually don't do, do the usual model or the typical model uh, that most accelerators use, which is taking equity uh, for funding. We actually give them a grant of right now 35,000 dirhams, which is about uh, $10,000. And we're looking into potentially trying something different, uh, which is revenue sharing as a model, because we're able to um, we're able to introduce them to a lot of customers. So that's um, one of the benefits of the uh, accelerator. In addition to that, there's free office space where they can wor work from Shira. They, we help them s set up their businesses in terms of giving them subsidized business licenses. Obviously, there's a lot of mentorship and a lot of guidance that happens. And then at the end of that journey, there's a Form, uh, after the four-month journey, there's a demo day where we invite investors and you know, leaders of private sector companies and so on to come and listen to these students and graduates as they present their businesses and to see how we can actually you know, attract investors or customers or partners and so on. So I'll just quickly take you through the journey um, so that you can see exactly how it works. So this is the, the initial part. Obviously, the first thing we needed to do when we started Shira was actually inspire people to even consider entrepreneurship as a career path. So we had to host a lot of entrepreneurs, graduates who had gone down the entrepreneurship uh, route to come back and actually speak about their uh, successes and inspire some of the current students. We then work with the students, like I said, to help them refine their initial ideas um, one of the ways that we do this, so the challenge when, when you're working with youth, especially uh, students, is that they haven't had much real world experience. And so they want to be entrepreneurs, but they don't really have the best ideas per se. So we want to help them in terms of ideation. And we do that two ways. By one, partnering with corporates. So for example, we partnered with Karim in the Middle East, who set a challenge for the student, a marketing challenge. The students then worked on different solutions to this challenge. And uh, the, winning, the winning team actually got an internship to implement the solution at uh, Karim. We're doing the same thing with Air Arabia. Again, they set a particular challenge in their industry. And this gives students a starting point from which to actually ideate and come up with pro real world problems rather than problems that they perceive uh, are opportunities. Um, so this, this again, it gives them that real world experience. And in addition to that, we have startup competitions such as Startup Weekend where we either host them on campus or we send some of our teams to actually participate. Funnily enough, we, there was a startup weekend that was held in Abu Dhabi uh, just about a couple of months ago in the fintech space. And we sent a team from AUS, knowing that they would be the youngest people there and knowing that the majority of participants would be investment bankers and people in the financial sector and so on. What amazed us all is that we, all we did was pay for their tickets and their, their um, accommodation. And you know, we, I was watching it on Snapchat as they kind of went through the night, staying up all night, working on their idea. They actually won first place um, and beat, beat the competition in terms of their ideas. So it just goes to show that you know, while the experience may not be there, the energy, the drive, and the commitment is. And so really working on building that, uh, building on that is something that we do. Um, once they've gotten their initial idea, um, we then put them into something we called an incubator. So this is, most of them are still uh, students when they're in, our, in the incubator, and they spend up to 12 months building their team, refining their prototype. And the problem with building the team is typically in universities, if I'm studying business, I'm only in the business building. I don't interact with the engineers or the designers and so on. So Shira becomes the space where they can all come in and collaborate and meet people from different backgrounds. So, you know, business people meeting potential developers, meeting potential designers and so on. They then go through this incubator. And what I, what I like about the incubator is we've really turned education on its head in the incubator because it's primarily student-led. So it's not us giving courses to the students, telling them you know, to listen to us and take notes as we are speaking. Most of these courses are actually delivered by students who are passionate about certain, so for example, if you look at the web development use, using Flask, that was actually um, done or conducted by a student who actually self-learned the skill using MOOCs, using books, and so on, and then shared that skill, built a community of developers, and now they're going around and training other uh, students as well. So we really are trying to get the students to take the lead, we're giving them a sense of agency that this, you are in control, this is your journey, we're here to help you, but ultimately you lead the way. And we use the feedback model as well, or the feedback loop, where 
They tell us what's working and what's not working. Obviously, 20 to 30% of the workshops, we do try and get external experts and mentors to come and uh, hold them. But like I said, the majority is student-led. And then this is a snapshot of the first 10 teams we selected for our accelerator program. So they were selected in October. They graduated just uh, last month in February. And the average age in, in the accelerator was about 25. And we had ideas across the spectrum. I'll go into two or three of the ideas. But what's interesting is it's also 13 different nationalities. And like I said, some of them are, I would say 70% of them are tech enabled and some of them have nothing to do with technology whatsoever. So I think it'll be interesting to go through a couple of them and just see what, these, what ideas these students are coming up with. So juxtapiece, this is a design, um, a design uh, team. They basically graduated from the American University of Sharjah. And uh, for their final year project, they came up with uh, portraits using wood. So you can see that um, in, the, in the picture over there. So they use four different types of wood, natural wood, without uh, you know, changing the wood in any way. And they create these uh, portraits that are basically 3D portraits. Uh, the one over there is of uh, Sheikh Khalif and Nahyan, the president of the UAE, and they've done other portraits as well. They've actually already been commissioned to, um, to do portrait, personal portraits for certain customers. What we wanted to do is also, I think, and this is really the biggest benefit we provide, is access to the market. So we use um, uh, juxtapiece to create our corporate gifts. So anytime we have speakers coming to Shara and so on, these gifts are all uh, made by them. We actually pay them to make them for us. And we've now realized that other government entities are coming to them and saying the same thing. Can you make our gifts for us? Um, and you know, paying them as well for that. What's interesting about this is, yes, it's not your typical VC business. A VC probably would not be interested in investing in this, but at the end of the day, it's created two jobs for the two co-founders um, who are graduates who now no, no longer need to look for the jobs. They're full-time employed. And in addition to that, they're creating jobs for other people as well. So that's what's nice about these businesses. Um, the other one, Tayyar. Tayyar means current in Arabic. They're basically, they've come up with an app as well as hardware, which they install for energy um, uh, monitoring and control. They've already, again, through an introduction, managed to implement this at the Sharjah police, uh, one of their offices, and they are now being asked to implement it at all the mosques in Sharjah. So yes, they didn't have a lot of funding from us, but again, these sorts of introductions and connections have really helped them grow and actually start organically um, generating revenue. Um, he's an Emirati, his co-founder is Pakistani, and again, a diverse team of both business and uh, engineering students. And then Hamza, Hamza is probably one of the more um, VC-oriented uh, businesses. Um, NS has basically got a background in machine learning and natural language processing, and he's using that to create a platform that corrects Arabic uh, spelling, grammar, and context, which is something that's, so if you, if you know of Grammarly in English, something similar, but for the Arabic language, it's something that's you know, very needed in the region and has been actually attracting a lot of interest from investors as well. So we're very proud of this uh, particular uh, venture. And then once they've graduated from our accelerator program, so they've gone through the ideathon, they've spent almost a year, six to 12 months in the incubator, then four months in the accelerator, we then add them to Manasa, which is a community of existing entrepreneurs and SMEs. And what we do here is, aside from the networking events and the workshops that are more relevant to growing and scale a scaling a business, we actually also um, provide them with uh, procurement opportunities. So for example, one of the government entities at Sharjah has committed 5% of their annual procurement to come from the SMEs that are registered in Shiraz Manasa program. 5% of their annual procurement is a pretty large amount. Um, and so we provide them with this list and then they commit to actually procuring and using the services and products of these SMEs. So again, access to market I think is key. Then one of the other things we realized, um, and this, this slide, slide is special, I'll come back to why later on, but we realized that with entrepreneurship, the key thing, especially in the region, is to build a mindset where you kind of uh, build this desire to innovate and to you know, take the initiative and not fear failure per se. Um, and uh, we do this by actually uh, partnering with youth, I should say youth of youth, because these are 12, 
12 to 17 years old, so they're much, much younger, but we try and work with them very early on to start giving them the entrepreneurial skills they need so that by the time they get to university, they're already aware of what entrepreneurship is and you know, how, know, know shara and know how we can help them as well. And so we've already trained in our first year 350 uh, young girls. And this, is, this was our graduation day, which happened exactly, I would say, a couple of weeks ago, 15th of February. Um, these are the 10 teams. They presented in the presence of His Highness Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasmi, ruler of Sharjah, and Sheikh Abidur, who's chairperson of uh, Shira'ah. And so you see the 10 teams over here. They actually had three minutes each to pitch. We had an audience of over 250 people, everyone from angel investors, VCs, heads of government entities, heads of private sector companies, all listening uh, to their pitches. And then had them, uh, each, each of the teams had kiosks where they could come and actually interact with the teams. So we actually had a lot of traction after the event with, where a lot of connections were made as well. So very proud to have our first cohort graduated in the first year and looking forward to starting our next cohort this summer as well. The other thing that we announced just recently at the same event is that we are now starting to build industry tracks. So we're working very closely with the private sector. There are three entities that we're working with. Uh, one is BIA, so Sharjah is positioning itself as the green capital of the UAE, so we've partnered with BIA to try and build more startups in the sustainability track. We've also partnered with Air Arabia, which is a low-cost airline in the UAE, um, to build the uh, more SMEs or startups in the travel and tourism track, and then with Crescent Enterprises uh, to build more social enterprises. Um, each of these partners has committed, like I said, $250,000 to help us build this. We basically take these students through the entire um, process from inspiration through to incubation and acceleration in partnership uh, with, these, uh, with these companies. Oh yeah, remember that girl I told you about? I told you this was a special slide. Um, you might not have noticed, but the person actually giving the talk is Sally, the girl I mentioned at the start. I did end up interviewing her and we did, because of her persistence, uh, she just wouldn't give up and so we said, fine, you've got the job. And I've been amazed at how she's truly come into her own. Um, she joined us, has pushed, her, pushed the boundaries, come out of her comfort zone. She was a very shy girl. She's now leading workshops for the youth. And in addition to that, a few months ago, she came up to me and said, you know, I've decided to start my own business um, with a couple of friends of mine. And uh, I said, okay, really, what, what's it going to be? And so she said that, you know, she's always had a passion for music and we've seen her perform several times. She's very good and so, so are her friends. And so they've started a platform for young musicians to basically bring their talent to the world. Most of, they've got, they started with about six artists. They've now got 45 artists in their database between the ages of 16 and 24. They've already played several gigs at various leading venues and if all goes to plan, they should actually be breaking even in the next couple of months. So it's been, it's been for me, a true story of seeing some, you know, the, the impact of actually believing in someone and in believing especially in the youth and their dreams and their ability and empowering them to actually achieve that. And I thought a good way to end this would be a video uh, of, so that you could actually see uh, Sally live in action of her playing at one of our events actually at the Shara graduation day. Um, and it makes me so proud to see this video uh, and watch her play live. So that's Sally and that's her co-founder. Ladies and gentlemen, I see this untapped potential in the youth every single day. And I really think it is our obligation, being from the region and having had the opportunities that we've had to really help and empower 
the next generation of change makers, of leaders, of innovators, and to really, to use Sally's word, to really stand by them as they come up with the solutions that, present, uh, that are presented in today's daunting world. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Yes, please. Um, it's me again, Ahmed. Hi. So thank you very much for your passionate speech. Shows that you're clearly driven by job creation and entrepreneurship. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. So next question, sorry to dampen the mood, but entrepreneurship means you also deal with a lot of failures. Yes. Yeah? Absolutely. And uh, for example, James Tyson failed about 5,126 times before he got the first prototype ready. Given the cultural pressures yeah. of not to fail, in the Middle East and Asia. How do you equip people to deal with pay failure and what kind of support network do you provide? So um, that's a really good question actually because that's the reason we start really young. Um, we start with children as young as 12 to start getting them used to entrepreneurship and understanding that it's okay to try and fail. We look at everything as a series of experiments. And if an experiment does not work, it just means that this one didn't work and that you just need to pivot and try a different way. It's interesting that you should uh, bring up the topic because one of our teams um, in, the, in the accelerator program, uh, she's called, her name is Nuha, and she started a social enterprise called the Mawadda Project, which basically teaches life skills to youth between the ages of 12 and 17. So she decided that she was holding her first workshop and um, you know, did a lot of marketing, uh, put it online, spoke to her network of uh, friends and family and colleagues and turned up on the day and literally nobody showed up. Zero people showed up to that, um, to that event, to that workshop. Initially, obviously she was distraught, but what impressed me the most is the maturity uh, the way she handled it. You can actually look up <clears throat> the same day she actually wrote a blog post um, and it's on Medium, and it's called Today I Failed and My Startup Finally Started. Uh, because she, she realized the importance of resilience and grit, and these are the kinds of skills that employers are looking for, independence, critical thinking, problem solving, entrepreneurship is all about problem solving, and also the ability to fail, to understand what went wrong, and to kind of take it from there. So she reflected on the experience, you know, realized that, okay, this is the worst case scenario, nobody turned up, I know what I did wrong, I know what I need to change, and we try it again. So the more that we try and help them look at this as a series of experiments rather than one big moment in the spotlight, the more they're able to cope with those uh, challenges. Hi, my name's Eric. Um, I think it's great that you're starting out at a very young age yeah. to encourage people to you know, get the mindsets for entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, how much do you think, um, say, uh, excessive government support uh, is like an impediment to people having an entrepreneurial mindset? So, uh, you know, I think particularly, say, in the UAE or in Saudi, yeah. it can be very easy not to, uh, to, it's like an extra thing that, you know, why would you want to potentially fail when, you know, it's pretty easy to get a job that yeah. pays quite well. So I think that, that, again, a really good question, and it's, it is one of the challenges we face specifically, uh, sorry, one of the challenges we face specifically with, for example, Emiratis, is convincing them, you know, they, they love to come to our events and talks and workshops, but it, when it comes down to actually starting the business, I think they, they typically, I, I don't think it's that the, the government route is easier. I do think it, it has what it, we talked, it has to do with what we talked about in the last um, question, which is uh, a mindset and a fear of failure and what will people say if I try and I fail and you know, and what will society think of me and so the stigma attached to failure is, is the issue. It's something that we're working on. We're actually doing uh, a, road, a road show right now to go to some of the more, um, so when you look at uh, AUS, I think only 15% of the student population is Emirati. We're now trying to go to some of the other universities where majority are Emirati and trying to showcase successful Emirati role models and entrepreneurs who have succeeded <laughs> to help them actually think about this as a viable career path. But I think, um, you know, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. They are very young, and I think, uh, but I do think that the education model is changing. It's, it's the question that I always ask myself is, are they too young to be entrepreneurs? You know, are we starting too young? But I think 
at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're not necessarily creating startups, but we're creating entrepreneurs. This, this venture that they've started may not be the one that succeeds, but they now have the skills, the drive, and the mentorship necessary to actually build a, a viable business in the future. Hi, uh, my name is Francis Dan. We're in heavy industries, steel, yeah. uh, mainly. I associate with your, um, basically what you said, like charges in the industrial heartland of UAE. Yeah. And we're actually looking to set up a company UAE. Okay. But what, whenever I think of Sharjah, I think of traffic, traffic grid. Yeah. <laughs> and it amazes me why your, the, your highness doesn't address this matter. And it, yeah. that's one of the biggest blockers to charge it. Yeah, and then in terms of um, uh, companies set up, uh, what advantages do you offer compared to Dubai? Because that's where everybody goes. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the traffic, yes, I agree. It's a, it's a big challenge uh, that we face. We're hoping the, that the value of what Sharjah can offer outweighs uh, the, the the challenges of traffic and certainly it has as, as an education hub you see people coming from Abu Dhabi and Dubai to catch you come and study in Sharjah which just goes to show that when you create value uh, people will come I agree that the roads need to be addressed and I know the government is doing everything they can but um, the, the situation is that the majority of people tend to live in cities like Sharjah and Ajman and in the north and tend to work in places like Dubai and Abu Dhabi where most of the jobs are and that's where the challenge is created I think the country as a whole continues to work on building the infrastructure, so hopefully that will get addressed with time. And I don't know, the, Dubai has recently announced flying cars, so maybe uh, that, that will solve the problem to some extent. Um, in terms of Sharjah being a good place to base uh, the business, I think absolutely access to talent is one of the benefits. It's a lower cost base um, than some of the other Emirates. Um, so I, I would say these are some of the, uh, the main attractions of, uh, of Sharjah as, a, as an entrepreneurial hub and as a uh, business hub as a whole. Hi, it's Hi. Tim Hadi here. I'm also a fellow of the Aspen Institute and uh, very proud of what you've achieved. Thank you so much. Um, my question to you, now that you've established a model yeah. in Sharjah and enabled Emiratis there, not just Emiratis, all nationalities. All so nationality. we're not focused only on Emiratis. We'd love to see actually more Emiratis take, uh, take part in uh, Shira. But one of the nice things, it's one of the few government-sponsored initiatives that's actually open to all nationalities. Brilliant. So that was my first question. Okay. The second question is, what are you doing relating to promoting a similar initiative in the more deprived yeah. Emirates, such as Ras al Khaimah and others? Yeah. And also, are you considering um, you know, being an example or developing partnership yeah. Uh, with other countries uh, around the same initiatives. I mean, you started off with statistics yes. for the whole region. Yeah. So I'm just curious about Absolutely. your interest in that I mean, we, we solve a challenge right now. We're touching the lives of hundreds, but we, this uh, challenge is in the size of millions. And the question that I kind of struggle with is how do we scale something like Shara so that every university in MENA has a platform like Shara where you know, students can actually go learn the skills that are A, relevant, to employers, you know, the biggest challenge we face with, with our uh, entrepreneurs is that they go through our programs and then the employers want to poach them because they've now been upskilled and they have all the relevant skills and so on. So it's all, it almost is like a bridge between uh, the, uh, the university and the workplace. So they get the right skills. Plus, in the end, rather than a degree, they have a, a business of their own and a real uh, business. Uh, the question as to how to scale it is the challenge. Right now, we're looking at Sharjah as a whole. So we are partnering with all the universities in Sharjah, and we work closely with them. And we're looking to potentially have a small hub in each of the universities. Uh, the, I think the one at AUS will always be the headquarter. But um, we're looking for a small hub in each of the universities. We have been approached by various universities asking to partner with us. And can, you, can we take that model uh, and scale it across the region? I think it's something we would definitely look at. But right now, it's just too early. It's our first year. We've just completed one year. So it's something we would probably look at in another year or so. But I, I absolutely agree that this is a model that needs to be scaled across the region. Yeah. I don't know who has the mic. So. Hello. Um, I'm Dalia. Um, I have two questions. Does Shara only support charger-based startups? And if someone has an idea that can't be implemented in Sharjah, 
do you advise them where to go? Um, so in terms of Sharjah, the only criteria we do have is that we ask that one member of the team be a graduate of one of the universities in Sharjah. But having said that, we do have two uh, wildcard options, if you like, which means that you can be from anywhere, you know, even if you don't have a team member that's a graduate of Sharjah. But we do want to focus 80% of our efforts on the 20,000 students that are already in our backyard. Um, in terms of if their uh, idea is not um, uh, implementable in Sharjah, we, we partner, you know, we don't see ourselves as just a one-stop shop and we don't partner with anyone else, one else. We're part of the entrepreneurial e ecosystem in the UAE. And so we're more than happy to forward them to other partners who may be of more uh, value to them. Hi, Najla. Hi. Um, thank you for the talk. Thank you. And I think what you're doing is amazing. Thanks. Um, a few years back, well, well, last year, when I was starting my company here in the UK, yeah. I was in conversation with Shira to move the company across. And I was told that it has to be a Dubai, a Emirat-based company. Yeah. Do you think this will change in the future? Or is it something that always be in place where you cannot move companies back to the Emirates? So I don't, I don't know the specific details of the situation. I don't know if you are saying that you're looking for a partner to start up the business or you wanted to relocate, but re you wanted to relocate over there? Okay, we, sh we should talk. I'm sure we can help you, even if it's not through Shirai, because Shirai is really a platform to help startups you know, start, it sounds like you're already an existing business, but what we can do is put you in touch with the research and technology park, which is coming up. Uh, adjacent to the American University of Sharjah, where they're trying to attract companies to be based there and actually, like I said, focus on doing their research and product development in Sharjah and giving them access to this talent pool as well. So I can, I'd be happy to put you in touch with them. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, oh, what, what about the limitation about, so if a company is registered here yeah. with 50%, 50%, isn't there a requirement that a Emirati owns part of the company? Uh, it, so the, the, the research and technology park is being set up, set up as a free zone, and so that, that means that the requirement is not necessary. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, sorry. Oh, sorry. Over here. Okay. Um, I, just I can't see you, but... Uh, Sorry. Okay, sorry, okay. Um, there seems to be a global trend or a trend in the yeah. West towards progressive learning, a shift from the traditional textbook or curriculum-based yeah. um, education that we have in maybe more primary schools than secondary. Um, do you see that shift happening in the Middle East or is there room for such schools or progressive learning environment in Middle Eastern countries or are we a bit too far behind in terms of implementing such schools mm -hmm. or curriculums to, um, for our youth or maybe in the primary education system rather than secondary? I, I don't think we're, we're, it's too late. I think there's absolutely a need for reform, education reform. And you're right, there are lots of different models. I mean, we, even when I was looking at Shara, if you guys have heard of you know, Watson University in the US, it's also a degree-bearing incubator. It's worth looking at there in Colorado. And you, know, you look at people like Peter Thiel, who are now basically paying people to drop out of university uh, giving, him, giving them $100,000 to actually work on, uh, work on their business. So I do think education is being disrupted. I'm not saying that universities necessarily are going to be obsolete, but I do think we need innovative platforms, like you said, alternative platforms like Shara that can be plugged in at, at different intervention points, whether it's at primary level or secondary or at high school and um, university level as well. So I, I do think that education, you know, you know, when I mentioned the social enterprise track, I think one of the areas that we're looking at over there is actually education. That's one of the themes that we're looking at because I think the market is ripe for change and innovation in the Middle East. You do see some uh, interest like Idraq, which is a platform for MOOCs. So that, that's, I think, uh, doing pretty well. And I think things are changing. I mean, I, I had one of our, my team members came up to me and said, you know, I'm doing my MBA, can you write a reference letter? And I said, well, you never told me you're leaving. You he said, oh, no, I'm doing it online. I don't believe in going, uh, you know, so I think that the new generation believe in doing everything online. So even if the, the universities don't do it, even if the education system doesn't, doesn't do it, the students are changing themselves. Their behavior is changing themselves. So I think it's going to be necessary in any case. Uh, we have time for la one last question. Yeah. Hi, thank Hi. you so much for your talk. You're most welcome. Um, it's extremely exciting to see a woman from the Middle East talking about entrepreneurship here to a group of people in London. So my question is really about that, the female role in entrepreneurship yeah. in the Middle East. Yeah. And I was pleasantly surprised by your presentation to see a lot of females highlighted. Uh, so my question is, you mentioned that it's difficult to 
ingrain the seed of not being afraid of failure, not being afraid to try something new and to lead yeah. in a new innovation. How do you plant that seed in females specifically yeah. in the Middle East? If because I find that to be a, more of a absolutely. challenge. And if you look at actually, if you look at our first batch, uh, 33 of the 10 companies are female led. For me, that's not good enough. It needs to be, you know, 50-50. I'm still not seeing enough females applying to uh, the program, and it's something that I, for, I take as a target for myself. You're right in terms of starting early, and that's why, you know, when we said we trained 350 girls, it's specifically girls that we did in partnership, for example, with the Sharjah Girl Guides, which is another NGO based in Sharjah, and we have Sajaya, which is another organization for young ladies. So again, working with them as early as possible and connecting them to um, other mentors, especially other female mentors. And again, it's, it's, it doesn't, you know, stop when they're young. It doesn't stop when they get to university. It's even when they're actually working on their businesses. We've actually recently partnered with Facebook uh, for an initiative called She Means Business, which we launched again about a week ago or so, and where we're, treat we're training and providing support to uh, women-owned businesses to help them use social media, uh, specifically Facebook and Instagram, to grow their businesses. So we all know that Facebook and Instagram are important, but the question is what kind of content should you po be posting, you know, how do you measure the results and so on. So specifically providing support uh, to female entrepreneurs is key. Is that it? That's it, okay. I'll answer your question later. <laughs> Thank you.